everybody to this uh, final day session on Asian security. Uh, it's a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, we all know that later today in Washington, we've got a uh, new president of the United States about to be sworn in who said some fairly unorthodox things and some fairly hard line things about security in Asia and about trade and economics as well. And I think that will set a new context uh, for some of the issues that we've become very familiar with in, the, in recent years, North Korea, the South China Sea, uh, all the issues surrounding the rise of China. So it's a perfect time to be discussing the context in which uh, Trump is going to be operating and how Trump himself will change that context. And we've got a great panel. Uh, let me just briefly introduce them. To my left, uh, Vivian Balakrishnan, the foreign minister of Singapore. Um, there. So today is Yoichi Funabashi, who is uh, chairman of the Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation and also one of Japan's uh, most experienced commentators on foreign affairs. Professor Lee Jun from Seoul National University, specialist in international relation, relations. And Luhut uh, Panjaitan, the Minister of Mar Maritime Affairs from Indonesia. So welcome to you all and welcome to the audience and indeed to anyone watching online. Um, so let me get straight into it. Uh, Foreign Minister, it seems to me it's a slightly tense time, to put it mildly, not just because of Trump, but because of the tensions that we've seen building in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. growing alarm about uh, North Korea. It's the Singaporeans are always noted for thinking calmly and rationally. So if you can give us your yeah. take on, on how things well, stand. Well, so the, the first thing I want to say is that I don't view this as a tense time. I think there's some un uncertainties. In mm -hmm. fact, there are some major uncertainties. Uh, we've got a new president about to take his oath. And I think the f <clears throat> first thing is we should, sep we should take him seriously, but I've been advised not to take it literally. Uh, so let's judge him, <clears throat> his administration, and his policies by actions rather than by words. So I think I would describe this as an expectant time. It's kind of weird, though, to say, let's, I mean, I, I know what you mean, but to say, well, let's just ignore what the President of the United States says because it's obviously nonsense and we'll just see what no, he does. No, 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 that, that's not the case. I, I, I wouldn't characterize that at, at all. But I think that the point is that he's an intelligent man. He's clearly responding to a political imperative, mm. domestic. And I think he in his own way, is going to exercise policy imagination. And you have to be prepared for novel approaches. Mm. So that's the way I look at it. It's not to dis be dismissive at all, sure. but okay. to accept that there may be things which we have not yet thought of. It may not be the conventional approach, um, but we've got to learn to live with it. Okay. Um, if I could give you a, a perspective yes, from, you, you need to understand we're talking about Southeast Asia. Yeah. And we're talking about ASEAN. I mean, with the exception of Indonesia, the rest of us, are small nations. In the case of Singapore, we're a city state. So what is it we actually want? What we're hoping for is to have a balanced and open and inclusive regional architecture. Now, those adjectives are important. You know, balance, open, and inclusive architecture. And this is a, a design, it's a strategic design that even goes beyond defense and security. So what does that mean? In reality, it means we want to avoid zero-sum games. We don't want to be forced to choose, to take sides. I think if we ever get to that situation, it's bad for all of us. Sure. Second, we want it to be open. And clear, one clear thing here is this commitment to free trade, open trade. Mm -hmm. It's not really about the individual uh, you know, free trade agreements, but it's really that if you look at the past 40 to 50 years, since the end of the Second World War, since the end of the Vietnam War, if you look at the opening of China in 78, opening of India in 91, and if you look at the progress that's been made throughout Southeast Asia, we have made enormous strides because we've had open free trade. We were able to plug into the global economy. And we've had peace and stability. So that's actually our, our, our paramount objective because we know that this formula has worked. And having stability, having access to an international regime, international law, and as President Xi has said, looking forward to improvements in global governance. This is the best possible outcome for us. Okay. Minister, I mean, you've just been, uh, it's been pointed out, Indonesia is, is the big country in Southeast Asia, and that's always given it a slightly different perspective. 
How do you uh, look ahead to the, the, the security challenges over the next year or so? Uh, let me begin with uh, what happened in Indonesia the last two years. I think we concentrate to improve our economy, which is, I think, very important. You know, If you don't have a good domestic thing, then I don't think this is the right time for us to go uh, overseas. So right now, our economy grew last year. It was 5.1%. Uh, and I think also the inflation is very good, 3%. And also poverty uh, ra uh, rate also good, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. giving some um, more confidence within the country. Number one. Number two, I think we are successful also to uh, see the equality program of the government. We are not talking also the only the the what is the growth of the economy. We are also look at how do we see the equality. Equality meanings we have seventy four thousand. Uh, villages, so we ha call it uh, village funds. So every village, this uh, government, uh, you know, give a budget to them to move the economy within the village. Why with this one is very important, you know, because 230 million Indonesian population is Muslim. So we have to treat them well. Otherwise, you're going to see some radicalism within the country. This is the potential threat. If you don't manage this well. Then it's going to be, you know, another big issue in the near future. So then we spend so much time to tackle this one. And now we believe we are ready in the, you know, in the inside of this issue. So we are very confident growth and equality is moving in the same uh, direction. So just to spell it out, so you're saying when you think of security, you think primarily of internal security and Islamist radicalism, first of all, rather than the broader region. Well, not necessarily saying like that, but because we watch this very carefully. When I was a minister, a coordinating minister for security affair, I oh, has a good meeting also with my counterpart in Beijing. And I think uh, a stand of government in Indonesia very clear. We don't, uh, you know, recognize a nine dotted line because you see, this is, uh, yeah, because they claim about the uh, Cheng Ho and about uh, you know. This is the uh, the famous Chinese nine dotted yeah, line. Yeah, we said we don't recognize that. We recognize unclosed 1982, yeah. which is I think the very basic thing that we have to respect by everybody. We don't want to see the, any projection power, power projection in the area. Whether this American or whether this is a Chinese, we want to see peaceful solution over there. We People say to me that Indonesia has become a bit more hardline on this over the, the last year. That other oh, uh, well, you not necessarily hardline, but uh, to make sure that everybody understand, we are not going to negotiate more assertive about then, that, that, you've, you, that you've been willing to stand yeah, up. Yeah, we are not going to negotiate about our own sovereignty. That's why I have to make it clear. So that's why illegal fishing, mm -hmm. this is we take care very much. We don't want to see this happen anymore. Before, we don't have this kind of policy. Today, very clear. The message is very clear. We don't want to deal with this anymore. But we respect to the uh, international law. This is, I think, very important. If we don't respect to the international law, it's going to happen. So back to the South China Sea. South China Sea, yes, issue. Uh, and if you look at the size of Indonesia, maybe you don't know where, you know, when I meet with the... Uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe, I mentioned uh, you know the size of Indonesia from Merauke to Sabang is eight hours flying time, yeah. while Jakarta to Tokyo only six hours to twenty minutes. <laughs> so you see the size, you know, you see the difference, you see the diversity. So to manage Indonesia, we need the strong leader. Now the beauty of Indonesia, because President Jokowi gave a good example, lead by example, never happened before. Mm. None, you can check, none the business done by the family whatsoever. So everybody cannot complain to him. And he dare to make up the, uh, his mind. He dare uh, to, yeah, to make a decision, even sometime, like, uh, like uh, subsidy. We took it out, the subsidy, mm. which is make our uh, fiscal room is very good. Now, our uh, state budget moving very well. So we allocated more and more budget for infrastructure to improve the quality of infrastructure, meaning what? bring more efficiency within the country, which is, I think, one of the topic, one of the biggest enemy of the Indonesia is, uh, is uh, inefficiency. Okay. P Professor Lee, um, when people talk about security in Asia, and particularly the Americans now, mm. often top of the list is, is North Korea. Uh, you're sitting in Seoul. Um, we heard that, I think, that Obama is meant to have told Trump that the number one issue facing America in security terms is now North Korea. Mm -hmm. Do, does it feel to you 
like that issue is reaching a kind of crisis point? Well, I, I don't think North Korea is going to uh, make a lot of, I mean, further, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, this threats that we cannot perhaps stand. Uh, North Korean nuclear program has been with us for many, many years. Of course, of course they're going to uh, do more tests. They're going to improve their missile technologies. Uh, they're going to miniaturize their nuclear bombs. That they will do. But uh, those things are not very new. Of course, the nature of the threats might change, but uh, you know, we have been able to manage North Korea problem. It was like, like a cancer. We also have in, in East Asia a lot of threats, such as uh, territorial disputes between South Korea and Japan, China and Japan, East China Sea, South China Sea. So those threats are not really new. These are not new challenges. We, were able to, we have been able to manage those things. And the leaders are uh, probably will be the same. Uh, President Xi Jinping will be there. Uh, Prime Minister Abe will be there for many, many years, and we're going to have uh, you know, new leader in South Korea, but uh, it, you know, what he will do or she will do may be very predictable. But Kim Jong-un will also be there. So Northeast Asia, I think it's going to be pretty much the same. So the new challenge will come not from within, but from outside, and this time I think it's going to come from the USA. Yeah. So what you're saying, or you're implying, is that you're wa more worried about the Trump administration's reaction to North Korea than about North Korea itself. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm very worried about uh, uh, President Trump's uh, reaction to North Korea because probably Trump administration will face a kind of legitimacy crisis or leadership crisis. Uh, his leadership will be challenged from within and from without as well. Uh, there will be a lot of resistance, a lot of criticisms, a lot of non-cooperation from within, from outside. Then, if the government is a populist government, I, I do think that it may well be a populist government, then in order to recover from the leadership crisis, uh, Trump administration might create some kind of crisis or escalate tension somewhere. And in Northeast Asia, we have a lot of fault lines, and North Korea is one of them. Mm. So I'm very worried that uh, the Trump administration might take advantage of it. But you, uh, I mean, just to pursue this point, and then I'll come to uh, Mr. Funabashi. I mean, mm. you, you, some Americans would say, and in, on a bipartisan way, not just Republicans, mm -hmm. it's intolerable for the United States to have to face the idea that North Korea, a regime like North Korea, can have a nuclear missile that could hit the west coast of the United States, mm -hmm. and they're worried that that could be a couple of years away. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that they should just live with that in the way that South Korea's lived with the North Korean nuclear threat? Well, at the moment, in South Korea, we have a power vacuum. And North Korea, very strangely enough, doesn't do anything. <laughs> it has been very quiet. So that means Kim Jong-un leadership is very rational. And secondly, Kim Jong-un leadership can be intimidated by the international society. So that means they can be deterred. So in other words, we can manage this problem. Of course, we should solve it. But for the time being, we have to manage, manage North Korea. OK. Uh, Mr. Funabashi, uh, let's talk about how Japan sees things, because Trying to make sense of where uh, the new administration is going to go on Japan is, is tricky because at various points Trump has suggested that he's not that interested in the U.S.-Japan security treaty, that maybe Japan itself should go nuclear. Mr. Abe did something very skillful in that he was, one, I think, the first foreign leader to get to see Trump inside Trump Tower and got some <laughs> kind of reassurances, but not, I would say, totally reassuring. Uh, so how do things, all, this whole panoply of issues, but in the framework of a new U U.S. president. How does it feel in Tokyo as you look out? I think Tokyo is ve very much uh, deeply uh, you know, concerned about uh, Trump administration's uh, uh, trade policy or trade non-policy uh, on top of this uh, alliance management issues. And uh, the trade is increasingly now uh, entwined with uh, security issues uh, as uh, Trump has reframed that, that uh, trade issues and security issues in very much combining way. Uh, so uh, we, we can call it as the geoeconomics uh, thrust uh, in Trump administration formulating foreign policy. And uh, I think Tokyo is uh, very much deeply concerned about the trade war actually uh, taking, uh, taking place. Uh, if uh, Trump's uh, rhetoric and words would translate into actions and policies. And trade war aimed at, at Japan as much as at China? I think so. I think uh, that uh, trade wars will not stop at uh, uh, just two big giants. And I think it uh, inevitably will spill over into that Asia-Pacific region, 
particularly in Japan, I think. Uh, well, the day before that, uh, that the day before uh, Trump's uh, uh, victory, uh, Japanese uh, uh, lower house uh, passed, ratify the TPP. So the Tokyo pinned a great hope on TPP uh, uh, to uh, uh, promote that the regional integration, the regional uh, 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 order. Now uh, uh, TPP is collapsing. So I think that's, uh, there has emerged some vacuum of, in terms of uh, uh, a regional order vision right now. Mm. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I sensed, uh, obviously, you, you, you're concerned about uh, Trump and the kind of uh, direction he's taking, and yet, what options does Japan have in security terms other than the United States, given the depth of concern in Japan about the rise of China? I think there is no other alternative uh, to uh, uh, U.S.-based security uh, system and framework in the region. So, um, and there is no substitute for that alliance system. Uh, to ensure that peace and security in the region. This, is, uh, this region is still uh, a jungle, a uh, rule of jungle prevailing, as uh, illustrated in North Korea, as, you know, as well as Taiwan, perhaps. So I think that's the best hope uh, for Tokyo would be to uh, sustain that uh, alliance system as much as possible, uh, uh, to prevent that uh, alliance system uh, from being compromised by this geoeconomic uh, short-term tactical calculations uh, emanating from Washington. Okay. So, uh, Foreign Minister, if I can come back to you. I mean, Rex Tillerson, who's actually often looked to as a voice of experience and calm, possibly, within the Trump administration, said something which seemed to me quite startling in his uh, testimony before the Senate, where he said that the U.S. not only could not accept that the uh, artificial islands that uh, China has been building in the South China Sea, but that they would potentially block access or tell the Chinese that they couldn't have access to those islands, which sounds you know, like something that could rapidly lead to a military confrontation. Is, is that how you read it? Well, I was surprised when I read that. Um, and I think we all await with bated breath to see how he will square what he said uh, with actions on the ground. Because if you take that literally, it must mean a conflict. It must mean war on the ground. And that's not something which any of us wants. And I don't think China or the United States want war either. Because if you think about all the discussions so far, the key point here is that everyone wants economic development. Mm. What I believe President Trump wants is jobs and business prospects for his companies which is an entirely reasonable prospect. If you think about the interests of China, China has done very well in the last, you know, since 1978, and it's been under the ages of the current regime. I mean, it's not perfect, but they've done very well. And surely it is in their interest to continue to do well. And with time, time is on their side. They'll do better, they'll become more strong. Uh, they don't want a war. And for the rest of us, you know, Japan, Korea, and certainly for us in ASEAN, we just want stability. We want some level of predictability. Then we can adjust our policies. I mean, we are, we are price takers, right? So we have to adjust, we have to accept the region as it is. We can't shape, we, can't, we don't determine the agenda of the world. I mean, you say, you make the point that China is obviously not in their interest to have a war given yes. how well no, things I'm have been going No, I'm certain it's not in their interest. But you also said, uh, to reiterate, yes. that there would be a war if America tried to blockade those islands. I mean, so you can't see China in, under any circumstances backing down on that? I don't think they will back down on that. So the United States and China needs to have some quiet, private, in substantive discussions. Perhaps they should have those discussions in Singapore. You're quite good at convening these well, things. I'll be, happy. <laughs> I'll be happy to host them. But, uh, but I mean, it doesn't matter where. The point is there has to be a meeting of minds yeah. and a deep appreciation of their permanent interests. And just a last question on this mm. particular theme. I mean, you said in your first contribution that Singapore and the countries of Southeast Asia generally don't want to be forced to make a choice between these two giants. Yes. But can you feel that squeeze coming on? I mean, I noticed, for example, the way in which the Chinese impounded those Singaporean uh, trans military transport things going through Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. That seemed to me to be 
pressure on Singapore, perhaps mm. because they didn't like what you had said about the international court ruling in The Hague. That was how a lot of people interpreted it. Well, I wouldn't interpret it that way. Um, I'll come back to avoiding a zero-sum game. Mm. And in fact, if you carefully pass the statements of the Chinese, and I believe ultimately even of the Americans, it's in no one's interest to force us to say you're either with us or against us. Um, and the reason we're, saying, we're taking this position is because we say, well, look, let's look at the past couple of decades. We've, been ha we've had good, open relations with everyone. And we haven't had to beggar your neighbor. We haven't had to have conflict. And we could all prosper together. So, so that's the point. I mean, there's a clear track record. And if you know, we hope that the major powers will not draw the wrong conclusions from that. Mm. And I, I, I'm still an, an optimist that, yes, you can have strong leaders. You can have leaders responding to populist pressures. But at the end of the day, if they take a longer term view, and they understand what the permanent interests are, and that economics actually trumps security. Well, then, we're at the World Economic Forum, yes. so I guess well, that's the right. Well, so this is, a, I'm preaching to the converted. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, so the point is this, what everyone wants all over the world, mm. at a people level, are good jobs. Mm. And they want to be paid fairly mm. for that. What companies want are opportunities to expand. So we've got to find a way so that people can get jobs and companies can expand. And we don't unfairly blame free trade. That, that's what I'm most worried about right mm. now. Well, the that, trade war rather than the actual shooting yes, war. Yes, it's a trade yeah. war because, and even the TPP, to us, the real significance of the TPP is not just the, the minutiae of the, the regulations and the agreement itself, but to reflect that the United States has real skin in the game in the economic development across the Pacific. And that this is best pursued in an open, inclusive, and balanced way, without be forcing people to take sides, but just to look at their long-term interests. Um, in the past 70 years, the Cold War started and ended without a nuclear weapon being fired in anger. Mm -hmm. Right? Europe, EU, for all these criticisms against the EU, the greatest achievement of the EU was to make war on the continent of Europe unthinkable, a continent which cost at least 60 million lives in the last century. That's great. If you look at the achievements of China and India in raising hundreds of millions from abject poverty to the middle class, that's great. If you look at ASEAN, we have 628 million people 2.5 trillion dollar economy. We're now supposed to be about seventh ranked in the world. But if you look at the demographic composition of ASEAN, we are young. In the next 20 to 30 years, we can quadruple our economy to 10 trillion dollars. We will be a major player. We will be a major trading partner for China, for India, for the United States. I mean, we're, we're actually in a good spot. We just need to avoid unintended accidents okay. and miscalculations. Minister Panterton, can I ask you about those two issues that we've been circling around, discussing, um, the fear of a trade war, and because you also stressed that your overwhelming priority is economic development. So the trade war, but also the South China Sea. We've talked about it, about the possibility of a, a confrontational attitude from the Trump administration, but equally, Many countries in Southeast Asia were unhappy about this island building uh, program. So how do you strike? Let's start with the South China Sea. I mean, if uh, a U.S. blockade or whatever Tillerson was alluding to is not the answer, what is the answer to the South China Sea island building? Uh, first of all, I think Dream Furat is very important, yes. ASEAN and uh, U.S. and China. They sit, have to sit together, you know, to look for the best solution for everybody. Because I don't believe that... This, Everybody wants to see, you know, open uh, war in that area, you know, because 5.1 trillion US dollar trade passing this area, you know. So everybody wants to see a peaceful solution on this issue. So it's again, ASEAN can play a big role in this area, like uh, 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 Fifiana said, you see, the size of an ASEAN economy is, uh, 
huge, you know, so it's going to be also bigger in the near future. So the role of ASEAN is very important. Uh, in, while Indonesia is the largest uh, member of uh, ASEAN, I think we can play a uh, much more active role in the near future. You know, the leadership of Indonesia, I think, is very important. And we believe right now we are successful to manage our economy, to manage our democracy, and we see also the maturity of our democracy. In the same time, we are considered quite successful to contain any uh, radicalism uh, issue within the country. So then we can focus right now or give more attention to this issue because if something happened in Southeast, Asia, Southeast China, then could affect everybody. Nobody can win in this issue, you know, even uh, China or America or ASEAN. So ASEAN can play an uh, active role. But if you understand also within the, within the ASEAN, it's not this is a you know, solid, uh, uh, solid uh, position on this particular issue. So we propose basically America and China don't push Indonesia to, be, to take a side. Let Indonesia also to be independent together with the ASEAN on this particular issue. Trade war, I think, is not a solution. It's going to be, you know, uh, negative for everybody. Uh, see, in China economy right now also is not as good as like uh, the last five years, and U.S. also trying to move up, and ASEAN I think uh, quite okay. Let's maintain this uh, issue uh, to solve the uh, problem with peaceful uh, solution. That's what we believe. In. Okay, Professor Lee. Uh how do you feel about the, this um, question that Vyoichi also raised about the merging of economics and, and security issues, the way in which Trump has said that they're no longer separate boxes, that he's going to use one as a sort of trading uh, issue with the other? Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that in East Asia we also have the so-called liberal international order. Uh, this may not be as liberal as Western Europe, but we still have open economy. We have multilateralism there. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no very unilateral country. Even China is very multilateral. And I always ask, ask myself uh, a question. If there is going to be a war between the USA and China, or USA and Russia, who is going to win? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the definition, of, question. Yeah, definition of victory is very vague these days. Yeah. I mean, uh, you see the Middle East, you, know, you can never win a war. And in this region, uh, I, I don't think there is one country that can actually win the war and to solve the problem by violence. Therefore, liberal international order has become very, very important. And the problem is that uh, with the arrival of Trump administration, I should bless uh, him on this inauguration day, but I, I'm, I'm afraid I have to say a few criticisms uh, about uh, his administration. Uh, I mean, the, the irony is that the U.S. Uh, under Trump administration is going to become increasingly, is going to become increasingly unilateral. And China is going to become increasingly multilateral. I mean, think about what Xi Jinping said mm. uh, a few days ago. He sounded very reasonable. He sounded very much liberal internationalist. So that means there is going to be a leadership change in terms of soft power. So East Asia, the liberal international order is going to be led not by a very liberal America, but by uh, the Chinese Xi Jinping government, and but, this but, is very But just ironic. to put the opposite case to you, because uh, I guess that's kind of my job, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, some people would say, well, hang on, you know, it, Xi Jinping may talk a good game here in Davos about how uh, multilateral he is, but you actually look at China's behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been building uh, fortified islands in the middle of the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. They have territorial disputes with Japan. They've been sending, you know, planes and ships into the East China Sea. These are not the sort of gentle uh, multilateralists that, that you seem to be th uh, talking about. Well, I mean, uh, most of the countries that are developing uh, have lots of problems. Even, you know, J Japan has territorial disputes with Russia. Mm. Uh, South Korea has territorial disputes with Japan. So these kind of sovereignty problems are always there. But what we have to pay attention is whether or not China is, is going to become very unilateral, using violence. But China is going to use multilateral framework to 
attract attention of the international society. And China actually is the main beneficiary of the inter liberal international order. There's no other But, but, but you, could, you couldn't call the, the island building multilateral action. That's as unilateral as it gets. Unilateral multilateralism. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, but free trade is very, very important to China. Sure, yeah, I is. agree with that. So you actually, I mean, you, you, you've had this tense situation in the East China Sea for, I mean, I remember talking about it four years ago when Prime Minister Abe rather uh, startled people by saying it was a bit like the situation before the First World War in Europe. Um, but it's kind of gone, I don't know, has it gone quiet or is it, is, is it still uh, as serious as it ever was? I think it's this very serious. Uh, I think both uh, Xi Jinping and Abe put the personal political stake on stabilizing a relationship uh, since they met uh, in Beijing at the margin of APEC meeting in November 2014. So there are still strong incentive on uh, both sides to uh, stabilize the relationship maintain uh, the relationship, good relationship. But I think that uh, fundamentally that, uh, that nothing has been settled. Um, and let me also uh, mention a couple of things on uh, this multilateralism and uh, China Xi Jinping's uh, you know, state, uh, speech here. I was certainly impressed with uh, his speech, his tone, uh, strong uh, position to uphold that uh, free trade. And that's good, that should be encouraged, okay? So it's very heartening to hear that. But uh, at the same time, uh, when China deals with the South China Sea, island issues, uh, nothing uh, is uh, multilateral. China is, has taken a strong position uh, to maintain that bilateral uh, on top of unilateral actions. And so uh, I think when we talk about that a liberal international order, it's not just about free trade. I think it's, it's about principle, uh, rule of law, transparency, governance, human rights, property rights. And I think this system, this principle is now being challenged, not only by China, but now by the United States. And this is, I think, that where we are now at. So I think that this is the most challenging to all of us. Mm. Uh, so I'm not that sanguine about that uh, prospect of uh, uh, Asia's future, uh, even though I really would like to believe. And uh, how would you compare your mood, say, now to five, ten years ago? To put it another way, have you always been worried, or, or, or did you used to think things were going okay, and you're now thinking, actually, I really don't like the direction of... I'm really uh, much more worried, uh, particularly uh, with this, the, uh, the advent of the uh, Trump administration. Mm. I think uh, this could be the really, uh, we have been talking about this game changer words many, many times in the mm. past 10 years or so. But this, I think, would be the biggest game changer. Sure. If Trump's rhetoric will really translate into actions and policies, I think that could unravel the whole thing of the whole premise of US-China relationship, liberal international order, and the Asia Pacific. ASEAN, for instance, could be the first casualty, in my view. You know, China has not hesitated to exert the pressure on the ASEAN, particularly with uh, regard to South China Sea issues, by using the tactics uh, to divide and rule. Perhaps to put it more accurately, divide and trade. Okay. <laughs> now, the United States, uh, as uh, Professor Regan said, has now uh, seemed to resort to unilateral and bilateral uh, trade deals over the multilateral. Okay. So I think that the ASEAN really, I think, would be in, under stress. And that it could even you know, start to unravel that this you know, ASEAN's uh, centrality of the regional order, ASEAN integration, which has been the a foundation of peace and stability in the whole Asia, East Asia. OK, well, that's a very uh, stark prospect. So mm. we have the Minister of mm. Foreign Affairs of Singapore here. ASEAN could unravel, could it? I think you need to look at ASEAN in perspective. We just celebrated 50 years. If you think about its origin, it was non-communist Southeast Asia at a time when we were worried. Remember, there was a domino theory. The rest of us would fall. It's part, it, and that really was an extension of the Cold War anxiety. Mm. Since then, we've incorporated um, you know, Indochina, and we now have 10. Right? The point is, 
I think people were far more critical in the past about ASEAN. And they said, well, you guys take so long to do anything. Mm. You depend on consensus. Nothing ever gets done. It takes so long. But you know, frankly, after the recent events, if you look at what's happened in EU and all that, ASEAN as an association that recognizes great diversity, and therefore that, in the, that obtaining consensus is essential, it's better to get the pace and the sequence right, rather than rush headlong into things. The other thing about ASEAN, and again, if you look at our history, we have always had big powers or colonial powers in our neighborhood. We've always had to make adjustments and find our way through this. So this is not, you know, I'm not trivializing the challenges we face, but the point I'm making is that we've been through a lot. And in our own way, as long as we remember that we are better off together, we're better off in a consensual, non-coercive relationship with one another, we can still play a relevant role. You're right. If America and China has a trade war or sh actual shooting war, ASEAN will be a grave casualty. You're right. So our interests, and to the extent possible, will be to try to persuade the two big powers don't fight about it. There's no need to fight. And one other point I yeah. want to make, which is advice from Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. who I, I, I see regularly. And he said, beware of final solutions. And he said, it's not, uh, and it's not related <coughs> to the connotation with the Nazi yeah. final solution, yeah, yeah. but that because if anyone thinks he's got a final solution, the problem then is that he's willing to go all out to fight to achieve that final solution. I'm making this point in relation to all the sovereignty disputes. There has always been problems of sovereignty in Asia. But the point is that if you can put them aside wherever they can be put aside, focus on building positives and on win-win outcomes, there's a lot more that can be achieved okay, well, without, without looking for a final solution. What's and that, I think that's good advice. And in that context then, but just briefly, because I want to bring everyone, the audience in as well, what do you make of the suggestion that the Trump administration may revisit the One China policy on Taiwan? Again, I want, I want to wait a few hours for him <laughs> to be actually in power <laughs> and to judge by actions rather than by words. Okay. Um, we are uncomfortable, frankly, with taking an overly transactional approach to this. And here I would give advice as an Asian, as a Southeast Asian. In Asia, relationships, credibility, commitment, and loyalty mean something. You can't put a price tag on everything. So that if, you know, if I had a chance to meet Trump, Mr. Trump, the President Trump soon, I would advise him on that. In, in a, you know, in a respectful, courteous, but uh, piece of advice from a nation. So, so you're don't saying put don't, a price. don't use the Taiwan no, issue as a no, lever to try no, to get a better don't, trade don't, deal? Don't, don't do things like that. It does not do your friends any favors. Okay. To, uh, Minister, before I ask the audience for some questions, we were talking there about ASEAN and ASEAN unity and so on. I mean, sitting as an outsider in London, yeah, just watching events from a distance, it seems to me that a lot of countries in Southeast Asia have begun to tilt towards China. Uh, you've so most obviously Duterte, uh, President Duterte of the Philippines, uh, saying you know that China's the new power in the region and trying to uh, threatening to kick the Americans out. But equally, Thailand, Malaysia. Do you see? I don't. I wouldn't put Indonesia in that camp. But mm. do you see other countries in Southeast Asia beginning to move a bit more towards Beijing? Well, I hope uh, no bread break exit in ASEAN, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I think ASEAN is still very solid so far. Of yeah. course, they have their own interests in some degree, and uh, yeah, we understand that fully. But uh, we also believe that we still can achieve uh, agreement among the ASEAN countries. If you look at now, ASEAN is going to be 50 years anniversary soon, and um, we still believe the the, what we call the spirit of ASEAN could help us also to bring stability in this area. Uh, we discussed earlier about the, what's the benefit of uh, trade war between the U.S. And, and China. I don't see any benefit for the, everybody, uh, whether for China or uh, U.S. or even for ASEAN. ASEAN, I think, is going to be hurt very much. 
So that's why we try very much, you know, to see the win-win solution in this particular issue. Number two, uh, let's see for the next one month what's going to happen in Washington. I don't think, and I don't believe that uh, Trump can, you know, deliver everything what he been, you know, bring to the com uh, during his campaign time. I don't believe that uh, anti-Islam become, uh, you know, become um, the reality because, you know, simple as, you know, because he's going to invest in Indonesia, his company, not the U.S., 1.2 billion US dollar. Are you going to raise anti-Islam while your money, you know, your, 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 uh, uh, I didn't realize that the Trump organization is about to make a 1.2 billion yeah, investment yeah, in, yeah. in Indonesia. That, really? Yeah. So, you see, you can imagine, you put your money over there, 1.2 billion US dollar, you're going to raise uh, anti-Islam against Indonesia. Then it's going to be hurt your own personal uh, investment. So we have so to rely on his that's business one indication. Yeah. You know, that's one indication that I don't believe it's going to be like this. You know, Maybe he has a bad experience with uh, some other, uh, you know, uh, area, but I don't believe that with ASEAN he can have some uh, difficulties, and I still believe that he can. We can see something different from the new administration soon. So that's my prediction. So uh, look at uh, uh, Trump's uh, pragmatic uh, uh, personality, and he can deal easily with somebody. I don't believe that he can, you know, uh, like um, confront with. Someone, uh, at the end, I believe that um, look out for the interest of everybody. If it is good interest for, uh, uh, for America, good interest for ASEAN and China, I think they can go along with this one. So I sense it's a split with the Southeast Asians inclined to say it'll probably be okay and so on, and the Northeast Asians, Japanese and South Koreans actually seem to be much more worried, or at least maybe from, or maybe it's just a split between <laughs> government ministers who have to be cautious and uh, pundits who can actually yeah. say what they think. You're right. <laughs> no, yeah. I, no I, 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 I am optimistic. Yeah. And as I said, look, all of us politicians have mm. to respond to our domestic constituencies. Foreign policy, trade policy begins at home, right? Mm -hmm. Then, next question is, what do you think President Trump needs to achieve for the sake of the American people? He needs to create jobs. He needs to provide opportunities for businesses, both within and outside America. And he needs to achieve security. Now, these three objectives are not unique to the United States of America. All of us want it. And the point which uh, Pat Luhut and I are trying to make is that I think, or we believe, all this can be achieved without a trade war, without a shooting war, and without unnecessarily pushing things to the edge in search of final solutions. Okay. And in our own, maybe we, it may be because it's Southeast Asia, we're used to, yeah. you know, we do things maybe slowly, maybe in a different way, in a novel way. We value relationships. We, and the key thing here, and this is, relates even to, to, the, to the situation, the relationship between the United States and China, is you need to build strategic trust. Yeah. Without that sense of strategic trust, everything else Let cannot me add a little bit, Pai. Huh? If you look at Indonesia, the size of Indonesia, Indonesia is the largest Muslim population. You cannot ignore it. Yeah, 230 million is a small number. Can you imagine like 0.5% convert to be radicals? What's going to happen over there? The size over 1 million something, you know. So Indonesia play a quite strong leader, a strong role in this area. And you've had people going over to Syria, haven't you? I mean, yeah, we have, but we contain, we're successful so far to contain this one. Mm -hmm. But then America should, cannot take it for granted, you know, that's the, 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 what, the position of Indonesia. Uh, we are with ASEAN, we work together with ASEAN, I think our cooperation also with uh, some member of ASEAN about the uh, uh, radicalism, counter-terrorism is very good. We have a very good relation with China. We have a good relation with America. So now what are we going to achieve, basically? Are we going to uh, zero-sum game or what? Are we going to see win-win? Hmm. And I believe with uh, reading his, uh, you know, his command and his personality, his family, he's not going to take a zero-sum game. I think his, uh, his solution is win-win. You're, you're cheering me up a little bit. Uh, Professor Lee. Well, I, I might have to say that I'm, 
a bit more optimistic than uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Funabashi, uh, Mr. Funabashi, particularly about uh, China. Uh, not really about the uh, Trump administration, because we have been worried about China for many, many years, 30 years, 40 years. China has been deceiving. Uh, China still remains as a socialist. It's an authoritarian country. Uh, it has a lot of problems. Rise of China, China threat. But for the last past 30 years, we have achieved economic growth. We have achieved more open market. We have achieved more free trade agreements, and China contributed about 70, 80 uh, percent to global uh, economic growth. And if, if China is benefiting from, from free, trade, uh, free trade, then China has to rely upon international institutions okay. for, for stability and predictability and transparency. I think I've just seen, the, is that the 15-minute marker? Oh. So I'm sorry about that. I thought we had rather more time. So I should <laughs> definitely turn to the audience now. Um, yeah, the gentleman at the back. Ken Choi, uh, Joseon Daily Newspaper from Korea. I'm a Korean. I beg to defer to Professor Lee's point of view uh, on North Korea. I have a great respect for him. We are good friends. But I worry more about North Korea than Donald Trump's administration. Uh, that's pure fact. And I think most <laughs> Koreans do that. Uh, just simple questions. Uh, it's inconceivable to talk about Asian security without Chinese or American panelists here. So I'm just going to throw you some devil's advocate uh, thing. Most Chinese that I meet, they always say that the root cause of this international conflict or problems are all because of the Americans. I just want to ask all, each panelist, what, what would you think? And as Minister from Singapore said, it's inconceivable to talk about, I mean, think about a war in Europe. And I think that's because they have a NATO. It's a military organization. Uh, is it possible that there is some sort of a, a ETO, East Asian Treaty Organization, you know, things like that, in Asia in order to eradicate any possibility of war? Thanks. Two good questions. Let me take a couple more book, uh, so we get more people with a chance to, to contribute. Uh, hands anywhere? So there's some people sitting behind me who I can't uh, see. Uh, yeah, L Lali Weimer. Could, we just, uh, could I ask uh, the gentleman from South Korea, slightly off the um, path question, uh, could I ask you a bit about how you see the future of your country's leadership? Yeah, yeah the, the, inter <laughs> the, good the internal political <laughs> crisis in, in South Korea. And, and the gentleman here has a third question. Shinji Kitaoka, president of Japanese International Cooperation Agency, and also professor at uh, Emeritus of Tokyo University. I have uh, a couple of questions. One is that uh, certainly the win-win game is uh, desirable. It's a must. But actually, it is possible. Only the, your counterpart is uh, hoping the same way. If the other side is not willing to be in a win-win game, what, then what would you do? Secondly, certainly, as uh, uh, Mr. Funabashi pointed out, the uh, best hope is uh, the continuation of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty as well as the U.S.-Korean Security Treaty. But uh, uh, in order to maintain those treaties, uh, what about the uh, division of labor between those U.S.-Japan and the uh, U.S. and Korea? Are there any, anything necessary to change? OK. So I guess that's the old issue of burden sharing. Should, should Japan and uh, South Korea be doing more, which obviously is very much at the forefront of Mr. Trump's mind. Uh, Professor Lee, since you asked directly about the situation in South Korea itself, do you want to take that one and also the burden sharing issue? Should, should South Korea be doing more to assuage Trump? Well, uh, with regard to the future of uh, my country, South Korea, I think uh, there is going to be uh, definitely a transfer of power from the current uh, ruling party toward the opposition party. I don't know who is going to be the next president, but uh, people are fed up with the so-called Aung San regime, which is the old system. So uh, uh, it is very likely that uh, the progressive party is going to you know, be the next uh, government. And what th that means is that it's going to be uh, somewhat more transparent, uh, less authoritarian, and it's going to be somewhat more future-oriented. But what I really want to see is a generational change rather than just a power change. Um, Secondly, about, about the ETO question, I, I think in, in East Asia, it is almost impossible to have a multilateral security framework because we have Russia, China, Japan, and, and the USA. And they are not East Asian powers. They are global powers. And if we have a multilateral framework there, it's going to be a global framework. And that is not possible. Uh, burden sharing, I, I hope you can do a lot of you know, division of labor, but we have history issue, and that really <laughs> yeah. Prevent us from cooperation. Yeah, what, what, Yoichi, I mean, what, I mean, obviously, Prime Minister Abe has been trying to sort of widen the scope of what Japan can do in a military sense. 
but what are the domestic constraints on him if Trump comes in and says, look, guys, you've got to spend more, you've got to do more? Um, well, I think uh, the Abe administration enacted uh, security-related bills uh, two years ago uh, to allow Japan to do more proactive uh, uh, contribution to uh, international peacemaking and pe uh, keeping by uh, mobilizing the military asset, Japanese military assets. So that was the first, uh, I think, the right direction, in my view. But I think that Japan can do and should do more. Um, I think first, Perhaps Japan really should play a sort of uh, uh, intermediary and even facilitator role uh, to uh, getting the, in order to get the United States engaged in the region uh, by uh, strengthening, us, for instance, that uh, civilian Coast Guard capability in South, uh, uh, North Southeast Asian countries such as Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia and the others. Uh, which actually Japan already has initiated that, that, that uh, 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 process. Uh, also, I think uh, Indonesia and uh, Australia uh, actually now has uh, uh, agreed to uh, uh, pursue joint uh, uh, naval patrol uh, in South China Sea. Uh, I don't think it has been activated, but I think that it's a great potential. So I think that gradually that Asian countries are now exploring how to really uh, pursue that autonomous way to uh, strengthen that uh, peace and security uh, mechanism in this region. In other words, Asianizing that uh, efforts. I think that's, uh, I think, in the right way. OK. Uh, further questions, anyone? Um, yeah, over here and then at the back and then the gentleman here. Gosh, there's so many. Uh, yes, uh, but but to, uh, the okay. person in my direct line of sight had the unfair yeah, yeah. advantage, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, Lee Howell, the World Economic Forum. Um, when historically, um, energy, or more specifically, energy security has played an important role in really the, what is, in many ways, sources of potential conflicts or actually led to conflict. Um, but that the energy story is changing, and it's changing globally, and it's also obviously changing in the Middle East, but I'll, predominantly, I would sort of reflect on what's happening in the U.S. Um, how do you think that will ch change some of the, 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 the uncertainty or anxiety around what you're discussing? Um, how do you factor in the energy picture here? Okay. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman just at the back there uh, against the wall. Hi, I'm uh, Mukund Rajan from the Tata Group of India. I was just curious, as the other large emerging power uh, in the Asian region, uh, do the panelists see a role for India to play in regional security? There's been talk about building out uh, blue water navy in India. Okay, and uh, just here. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Anin Bakri from Indonesia. Um, coming from business sector, this geopolitical instability and uncertainty is certainly not a good thing and not sustainable. So how long do you think the US and China uh, tension will be there until they find new equilibrium? Thank you. Yes, well, uh, yeah, last one, just, just here. OK, two more, one, one there and one there. I'm Yoshi Hori of Globus Japan. I have a question to Professor Lee. You mentioned about history. However, Japan and Korea has agreed upon a comfort woman issue as final and irreversible. And however, the issue is coming back again. And there was a statue being built in front of the uh, Busan Council. And, uh, the, and the ambassador has been come, coming back to Japan. How can we solve this issue? It should have been final and irre irreversible. And we should okay. look for the future. And what is well, your comment? OK, last one chap over here. Yes, my name is Tadashi Mayer, uh, CEO of Japan Bank of International Commission. One uh, uh, quick comment on the Chinese policy, and also one question to the uh, both uh, minister from uh, Southeast Asia. My comments on, on China policy is that despite a very much proactive speech by uh, President Xi Jinping, they, uh, China is pursuing their own national interest. They are not mixed up the issues like, uh, between trade and security. Therefore, that now that they are not, Mr. Xi Jinping is very well calculated to gain something from the uncertainty created by John Trump. So that he uh, made the spread on the impression of a pro-trade, free trade China to, uh, to take occasion of World China Sea, uh, World, World Economic Forum. So my question is that what China did in maritime security issue in South China Sea uh, with uh, uh, ASEAN countries, what China did is that try to make the, the uh, divide and rule in 
in uh, ASEAN country. There, uh, cast some of the influence over Cambodia and Laos to uh, not be uh, created a, a uni uh, uniform uh, the, uh, position on the entire ASEAN. They tried to make a divide and rule. So how do you see that your the position with Chinese counterpart from your viewpoint? Okay, well look, uh, we've got five excellent questions in less than five minutes, so I don't think anybody's going to be able to answer all of them completely. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can pick one of the issues that, that's been raised and also make uh, some closing comments. So perhaps I'll go in reverse orders and end this time with Foreign Minister Balakrishnan. Uh, so Yoichi, uh, do you want to pick up on some of those points? I mean, we talked about energy, about... Yeah, certainly I would like to pick up uh, Lee Howell's uh, inquiry about the energy uh, geopolitics. Um, let me just uh, confine that issue to Japan's case. I think uh, Abe and Putin met uh, uh, in, Tok uh, in Japan most recently, uh, last month. And one of the factors which really uh, now gravitated both countries to uh, search for more rapprochement uh, is uh, energy factor. Uh, increasingly, uh, the world has seen, the Asia particularly has seen that uh, sea lane uh, defense and uh, energy security being uh, challenged by, say, uh, <clears throat> melting down, uh, uh, you know, Middle East, as well as uh, militarization of South China Sea. So from Japanese uh, energy security planners' point of views, uh, it's almost imperative for them to really uh, seek to that, uh, diversify that uh, energy uh, sources and that Russia is in a very much uh, in, in good position uh, to provide that, particularly the gas L in LNG form for Japan. And already 8% of Japan's uh, 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 energy, uh, fossil energy, I should say, comes, has come now from Russia. And Russia actually has proved to be a very stable, reliable supplier. OK. Professor Lee, uh, you were asked about the, the revival of the comfort women issues, if you want to briefly address that, but also perhaps uh, can't have a concluding comment or two, all in a minute. Okay, uh, the comfort woman issue, uh, when it was announced by the foreign ministry, everybody was taken aback because uh, Park Geun-hye administration had been very hostile toward Japan, but all of a sudden they came up with this agreement. So from the start there was a legitimacy problem. Uh, so people were not really, uh, you know, uh, for the agreement. And, and secondly, uh, the Japanese approach toward this issue is very much legal uh, and very much economic to a certain extent. And South Korean approach is not only legal, but also attitudinal, uh, you know, political. So we really wanted to see, you know, very sincere, uh, uh, you know, apology from the Japanese counterpart. And that, I mean, in the minds of South Korean people, that seems to be missing. I, I'm, I know that you, you have different opinion, uh, but that is the situation in South Korea. And I, I want to end my, uh, you know, uh, comments uh, with this note. Uh, I do think that America will come back to the liberal international order. Donald Trump will be re-socialized into the liberal international order. So it's going okay. to be okay. G good. Well, that's nice to end on a positive note. Uh, <laughs> Minister, uh, you know, there are a variety of issues raised, but um, this question of uh, how long this U.S.-China thing is going to keep bubbling, you, you were asked by your compatriot. Um, <laughs> what, what, what's your answer to him? We should ask the fortune teller about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> uh, they should uh, consider their own uh, ec uh, domestic economy, number one, I believe. And I uh, think, um, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, Trump's promise time to time to create job opportunity in within the country, you know. Uh, so if something happened between China and and uh, U.S., I don't think they can create job opportunity within the country. So uh, they look for a solution. I don't believe this is going to be like this for a long time. Maybe they can be like, you know, certain level of tension, but I don't believe they're going to be, uh, you know, to the level of... Uh, open uh, trade war between, uh, even the war, uh, conflict, open conflict uh, in the South China Sea. So okay. I still very confident that uh, they can look for the solution, win-win solution to, uh, for this uh, issue. Okay. Foreign Minister Balakrishnan, yes. your, your last words. And also, we were correctly reminded that we hadn't mentioned India as a major player. Yes. If you could just have a couple of thoughts on that as well. Yes. I'm a believer in real politics. If we allow ourselves to be intimidated, 
if we allow ourselves to be divided, if we allow ourselves to be distracted from economic growth, good jobs and prospects, and then we deserve our fate. That's the first thing. Second thing is to understand that big powers have a standard playbook. And everything which they're doing now is not really new or novel. But the way I approach it, first amongst my own brothers and sisters in ASEAN, is to remind everyone that it is our, in our own interest to stick together, to maintain neutrality, to expand our strategic options, rather than to be divided and broken down into a series of vassal states. And that's eminently rational. Similarly, when I meet the Americans or when I meet the Chinese, I also tell them, yes, you can play this game, but it is in your own interest to have ASEAN intact, ASEAN centrality, so that you don't have some, yes, some may go with you, but others will go the other way. It's not in your interest for ASEAN to be broken up and to play you know, in, in, into rival factions. So the point again is to focus on long-term interests. And I want to come back to the theme because it addresses the point on, on India as well. Southeast Asia, geographically, has always been at the crossroads or cross-maritime routes between China and Japan on one hand, India and Europe on the other hand. And now in the globalized world, America is involved as well. As far as Singapore is concerned, we believe in hosting everyone. Yes, the American Navy calls on Singapore ports, so does the Chinese Navy, and in due time, so will the Indian Navy. And as far as we're concerned, the more, the merrier. Because I come back to this point, that it is in our own long-term interest to have an open and inclusive architecture. And if we can focus on that, the security will become a second-order question. It's only if we lose sight of the long-term permanent interests uh, then we are likely to get into very, very choppy weathers. Now, I don't think anyone can give you a timeline <laughs> as to when we'll see blue skies and placid seas again. But I don't think that we should be unnecessarily gloomy or worse, create self-fulfilling prophecies so that people think they have no choice but to react over defensively uh, and there's no room for a deal, no room for alignment, even if it's only temporary. Okay. Well, you have a very calming bedside manner, which is appropriate well. for a former doctor. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much to, to the whole panel and to the audience. Thank you. Okay, sure, go on. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.